everybody to this event. It's nice to see so many people here. Uh, my name's Jo Haig. I'm co-director of the Grantham Institute here at Imperial College. Grantham Institute is one of the college's global challenge institutes. Our remit is climate change and environment. Our vision is a sustainable, resilient, zero carbon future. And our mission is to support and contribute to research, education, innovation, to, to help along with um, environmental and climate change effective action. So we have a number of activities and events, and we like to hold panel events like this in order to um, exploit the wonderful people that come along with the expertise to have a really informed discussion about uh, topics of importance to climate change and environment. And today we've, um, we're talking about uh, BECS, um, partly because it's uh, an important and perhaps controversial topic, and also to launch our, one of our briefing papers. We have a series of briefing papers on a number of different topics, but today I hope you've all seen outside there's issues of available of this BEX deployment, a reality check, and the discussion will be around that. So we've got a number of um, academics at Imperial College who work on rel uh, relevant uh, studies. In particular, we've got people who work on plant biology. We've got people who work on the sort of technological aspects of BEX. And we've also got people working on the models. And they've all contributed to the discussions that went in to the writing of this report. And the producing of the report um, also instigated a number of uh, interesting internal discussions, which I hope will be continued here. So BEX is uh, important because it may be helping with the carbon um, problem, but it's also become um, almost like a sort of silver bullet, perhaps by the IPCC and others, in terms of how we're going to solve the carbon problem, how we're going to get the carbon out of the how to get the carbon out of the atmosphere, and so we can perhaps continue emitting longer than we might do otherwise. This is a bit of a, a background story. Anyway, I'll leave it to um, leave it to the experts, which I'm not. Um, I'm very pleased to see so many people here, and we hope that the panel discussion will engage you um, into contributing and learning more. So now I'm going to hand over to the person who's going to chair the event, which is Dr. Joanna, Joanna Portugal Pereira. Joanna's a senior scientist working for the IPCC Working Group 3 office, which is here at Imperial. She has extensive experience in uh, climate change mitigation techniques, um, and she's got an excellent grasp of how these issues are going to play out, so she's a great person to be chairing the panel. Thanks, Joanna. Um, thank you, Grant, and thank you, Joe, for the kind invitation. And I would like to welcome you again to this Grant Institute seminar on debates surrounding BACs. And as being a senior scientist to IPCC, I just echoes the importance of BACs in reaching global warmings of 1.5. Uh, negative energy technologies, specifically BACs, have been surrounded by intense and alive debates, and I hope the discussions will contribute today uh, to have informed opinions about the topics. Out of the four illustrative scenarios, pathways, evaluated in the special report of 1.5, three rely on capture of carbon with bioenergy systems. So, um, Carbon capture surrounds from 100 to 1,200 gigatons by 2,100. And there's big concerns about eventual side effects and also synergies related to deploying these technologies at such a large scale. So I will leave the speakers today, the panelists, to share their views and with you answer all the questions uh, later on. So I'd like first to welcome uh, Dr. Alexan Corbell and Mathilde Fardy, who will be discussing specifically the paper they work on. So Dr. Alex is a research associate at the Grant Institute here at Imperial. He works on long-term scenarios uh, based on integrated assessment models and also bottom-up approach with specific focus on energy, land and climate nexus. Mathilde, uh, she's a PhD candidate in the Center for Process Systems and, um, Engineering and the Center of Environmental Policy here at Imperial. Her doctoral research investigates potentials of negative emission technologies for 
climate mitigation with focus on bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. And she's the first author of the paper uh, presented and published by Grant Institute. So the floor is yours. So we'll, we'll be giving a, a double act with Alex to present the, the findings. How do I? Um, it's not obvious that sorry. Um, yes. One here. So, that's one? Uh, yes. Perfect. Okay. Uh, great, thank you. All right. So, can you all hear me in the back? Is it okay? Okay. So, Joanna has already introduced kind of the context of this paper, which is that we need some form of CO2 removal to meet, um, well, to meet on temperature target by the end of the century, so 1.5 to, to 2 degrees. Uh, so this graphic on the left uh, are the, is a chart from the latest IPCC report uh, on global warming on 1.5. And what this CO2 emissions trend from today to 2100 show you is that first, all scenarios require some form of carbon dioxide removal. So that's the orange uh, afforestation land use piece and the bioenergy CCS piece in, in yellow. Um, you need that CO2 removal quite soon, so as early as 2030 in some of the, some of the scenarios. The scale of that CO2 removal really depends on how much and how fast we mitigate emissions today. Um, and in all cases, it will, be, it will be a challenge, either in a P1 scenario where we curb our emissions drastically in 10 years, or in a P4 scenario when we have to roll out a lot of CDR to make up for our lack of action or um, for not mitigating fast enough today. Um, and so to come back to the BEX issue, you can see that all of these scenarios uh, rely a lot on BioNG CCS, and really that level of deployment was the spark of the controversy, or sparked that controversy around, is that level of deployment actually feasible and sustainable. And so this is where this paper came from, and so the goal of that paper was really, well, first to kind of identify the key uh, aspects, aspects that we need to be careful about when thinking about BEX deployment. Second was to think about how much sustainable BEX could we actually do, and third uh, it was, uh, what are the steps that we need to take to foster BEX deployment uh, coming from that limited, uh, limited deployment perspective. And so a key point that we wanted to, as to address first in that paper was that there's just not one single BEX technology. There are very different types of technologies as a function of what you're trying to, to deliver in terms of energy products. So with BEX, you could do biofuel, you could do bioelectricity, you can also do bioheat or biohydrogen, and really, all of these different uh, um, pathways to negative emissions will differ by their cost. So some might have a lower capture cost than others, such as biomass to fuel. Uh, they'll differ by the conversion energy efficiency. Uh, they'll differ by avoided emissions. So as a function of what energy product you're displacing in the energy system you're, you're providing energy to, uh, you can have more or less CO2 avoided and also CO2 removal. So for example, biomass to fuel uh, in the case of biomass to fuel, some of the carbon is still trapped in the fuel, and so you'll emit that carbon back to the atmosphere when using that fuel. Uh, so you, you're actually removing less CO2 than if you were converting biomass to electricity. So there are traders within all of these pathways, and depending if you are trying to mitigate or decarbonize a sector, or if you're trying to do a maximum amount of carbon dioxide removal, each pathway will have different value. But regardless of what pathway, you, pathway you're taking, they all require um, uh, a biomass supply. So from production level to processing level, transport level, uh, then each of these steps might require some energy in the form of fuel, in the form of electricity, but also may, re may release CO2 emissions. Uh, so associated to the energy use, but also from land use change. So for example, when you convert a land type to a bioenergy crop, that might, uh, there might be some direct and indirect land use change involved, uh, but also from fertilizer use, for example, when you uh, that can release N2 emissions. And so all of these uh, supply chain emissions and energy use may result in a reduced performance of BEX in terms of net energy provider and net carbon dioxide, net carbon dioxide uh, provide, removal provider. And so these all need to be considered and, and, and certified within a certification framework. And so the life cycle emissions of biomass may impact BEX carbon negativity and may also impact BEX carbon negativity over time. So that's a particular case 
um, associated with land use change that we wanted to be clear on. So when you uh, have land use change associated with the conversion of, of, of a land type to buy energy crop, um, your initial emissions from direct and indirect land use change can be so high, especially for example if you cut down a forest to, to plant your bioenergy crop, that it may take you a long time to pay that initial carbon debt. And that's the concept of delayed carbon removal or carbon break even time. And so, of course, you want to avoid these cases. So the green cases, for example, is where you, you chop down a forest to plant bioenergy uh, bio crop. And that, carbon, and that delayed carbon removal can be as high as 50 years, as opposed to using marginal land, for example, and rebuilding that marginal land with a bioenergy crop, uh, with which you can be carbon uh, negative right away. And so time also needs to be considered in that perspective uh, to make sure Bex is developed the same, deployed in a sustainable way. And so I think, Alex, you're taking over the sure. next part. So um, now if we start delving into a little bit more on the, into those four illustrative scenarios that uh, came out of the uh, SR 1.5 database um, uh, report, Matilda built uh, some of these graphs based on the data that's actually in the database associated with the report. And if we look at the different, um, the four different scenarios will have very um, different impacts on land use. For, so land demand, if you need a lot of bags, you need a lot of dedicated crops, if you're actually planting the, the, the bioenergy feedstock to make, uh, to, to, to make the energy, you may get into some very high levels of, of, um, of uh, land demand. And just to put this in context, um, if, we, if we say we're going to remove 12 gigatons per year by 2100, uh, we're looking at uh, the results of, uh, of the Monet model show us that this is the range of water use. So you also need a lot of water if you're planting these, uh, these crops. Um, and then these are some water use uh, assessments, uh, estimates that have been done currently for 2013-2016. So we, we are in a, a, a range that is really, really high compared to what we're using today already. So this is a concern if you're doing dedicated crop, um, energy crops for, for Beck, um, for Beck's uh, activities. And just to have you an idea of, of, the, of the range of, uh, of land demand, today cropland area today in the world is 1,500 mega hectares, million hectares, and if we look at the worst case scenarios, we're looking at about half of that. Um, of course, this is the range where we think is the more reasonable range to be, but this is not going to give you 12 gigatons. So this is where a lower range of, of availability of biomass feedstock will have a smaller impact on, on land and on water as well. Um, and today the total water use in agriculture is 8 billion cubic meters uh, per year. So you can compare that with the numbers that are up there. Um, so if we look at, again, into, into these mitigation scenarios, but looking at a different quantity now, we're looking at the actual energy provided. Um, this is the, the bioenergy in these, these four scenarios, and we get up from today, which is roughly 50 exajoules per year of bioenergy that we are already using today. Some of the higher scenarios would get to 400. I mean, that's an eight-fold increase. The lower ones, we get to about 100. So it's a doubling of what is actually being you produced and used in the world today. Uh, so it's a more sustainable uh, range if you look at impacts on, on land and natural ecosystems, water use, as opposed to if you go to the really uh, high levels of deployment. And the difference between these scenarios is actually how much we, what, what the level of effort is in the short term. So which scenario we end up in needing to, to deliver to get to our tar temperature targets is a function of our short-term action. So we are having this discussion because we should have started mitigating 10, 15, 20 years ago. So if, we, if we had done that effort in the past, this discussion wouldn't even be this heated today. However, because of delayed action, we start getting into the need to remove some carbon from the atmosphere in order to even have a level of confidence that we can keep temperatures from rising beyond the, the stated targets in the Paris Agreement. Um, so this is bioenergy supply in 2015. This is what I was saying, is about 50 
exajoules per year. This comes from the International Energy Agency. And we can see that most of it is in traditional use. So this is collecting wood for burning in wood stoves, cook stoves at homes and, and, and agriculture. Uh, there's a sustainable bioenergy potential assessment. The, the diamonds, this is the, the range in the literature, so it goes really high for dedicated energy crops. The diamonds represent what the, 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 the there's, but there's confidence that it can be sustainably harvest, harvested. So what is the level that can be sustainably harvested of residues, both agriculture and forestry, dedicated forestry, and dedicated energy crops? So if we sum these three up, we get to about 100, but of course, it can go much higher. I mean, there's potential, technical potential for, for deploying much higher levels exist. But what is considered sustainable with high agreement in the literature is much, in the, much more in the lower range of, um, of these assessments. Um, so how much BECs can be sustainably deployed? Uh, if we assume um, a CO2 efficiency of the different routes of bioelectricity and, and biofuels uh, of 15, 60% for bioelectricity plus the CCS, um, and then the 30 to 40% um, the, with these characteristics for, so there's some assumptions that have to go into this modeling, then 100 exajoules of primary bioenergy could give us, if you're talking about, uh, if you assume that you're going to do all of that in electricity, so 100% bioelectricity, the range of 5.3 to 6.3 gigatons of CO2 per year of direct removal from the atmosphere. Um, 100 by, 100, if you go to 100% biofuels, that means you go take all your bio feedstock and make liquids, uh, the CO2 removal is lower, 3.2 to 3.9 gigatons of CO2 per year. And if you do a mix, it's going to fall in between. So, where to now? I mean, so, so these are the options that can be, uh, that need to be um, considered in terms of moving forward. So if we plan for the future with a portfolio approach, so do not treat this as a, uh, as a silver bullet, but tighten the thresholds and broaden the scope of the sustainability standard. So make sure you have a, a good standard in place. When it is deployed, it should be with CCS as much as possible. If you're going to use bioenergy at all, Make the effort to deploy it with carbon capture and storage. Um, think in terms of products and their value to the energy system, bioliquids versus bioelectricity. Credit the service of carbon removal, so give proper credit where it's due, and get CCS going. So there's, there needs to be a de-risking of uh, activity today. And this is something that needs to be ramped up, and we are not there where we need to be to get this uh, up to the scale that it needs to, to be at. Um, these are additional slides that we're not going to go into now, so I'm going to move on from here. So do you want to introduce the, can you switch the presentations too? Yeah. So thank you very much, Alex and Mathieu. Thank you, gave us uh, a very brief uh, overview about the challenge we are facing. On the one hand, we require backs to to control our carbon budgets and to be below the limits to reach global warming of the 1.5. On the other hand, we need to consider other dimensions of sustainable development goals and potential side effects with other ecosystem services. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce Rebecca, our third uh, panelist. And Rebecca is the head of sustainability and policy at Drugs Group. She's currently responsible for the sustainability of the global forest supply chains used to produce biomass and its po um, power stations and for the research and policy work in the company. She has extensive experience working for a number of energy business and range of topics, including bio, biofuels, land use, forestry, and climate change mitigations. Yeah, if you could. So I'm just gonna say a few words before the, the debate starts, rather than giving a full okay. presentation. I'm gonna start by, um, can you hear me? Sorry. I'm gonna start just by talking a little bit about what we're doing at Drax, actually. So, for those of you who don't know, we're the largest power station in Britain. We produce 7% of UK power. Um, we were um, a coal-powered station, and in sort of the mid-2000s, 2010, we started to co-fire with coal. We've now fully converted four of our six units to burn biomass. So we're the largest burner of biomass in the world. 
Um, and so you could say we are ideally placed to, to look at BECs. When you see these numbers that, that are being talked about around BECs, you're going to need quite a lot of bioenergy to actually generate that CO2 to store. So um, we've partnered with Sea Capture, which are a spin-out company from the chemistry department in Leeds, and they have some CCS technology, which we are um, now at a demonstration level at the power station, and we're, we've got a small demo plant which is capturing about a tonne a day at the moment. And we're looking to store that um, in the next few months. We're going to start storing that. And if you've got any ideas for utilisation and want to partner with us on that, please come and talk to me afterwards. Um, we're also looking at being part of the hull, that the Humber cluster. So I think it's really important um, that if CCS takes off, we have these clusters so that we can work with industry as well and really get some synergies of, of scale on that. Um, so we've got four units out of our six tracks burning biomass. That's about 7 million tonnes a year. If we were fortunate enough to, to get some support to um, put BECs on all of it, that would be about 16 million tonnes um, of, of captured carbon a year which is still considerably less than the 50 which the Royal Academy um, of Engineering and the, the Royal Society proposed for the UK in their paper. Um, what would we need to make this happen? Well, the government have committed to a, a roadmap. Um, they're proposing some, to come out with some policy options for broad greenhouse gas removals, and we do see um, this is only part of, that, part of that bigger suite of greenhouse gas removals that we're going to need. Also looking at market mechanisms um, to support CCU and CCS, um, and also are they are planning to run a consultation on CO2 transport and storage. And all of this is needed, and some real key sort of policy structure around this. And I see what's also important in that is to get the sustainability governance right. So we have some of the strictest sustainability governance around biomass feedstocks at the moment, but obviously we can go further. And this is something we're looking at very, very closely as a company. And we're working with scientists to say, what do we need to do to further demonstrate both that the feedstocks we're using now are sustainable, but also understand as science develops where we should be going in the future and how to define good biomass. So that's all I'm going to say for now. Thank you very much, Rebecca, for introducing the views from a company that already has four units of bioenergy in place and the views from the private sector and your challenge in terms of uh, institutional governance and, and regulations that need to be put in place to scale up uh, backs and make it a reality worldwide. So with no further ado, I'd like to welcome our fourth speaker, Keith Rowriske, if I pronounce it correctly. Um, Keith is a Deputy Director of Bellona Europe and he has worked as a carbon capture and storage specialist since 2011. Um, his fields include developing of CCS in energy and industry and defining policies to, to scale up technologies. He had contributed to a diverse number of projects, including techno-economic modeling, along with energy policy and economic incentives for industrial deep decarbonization, CCS uh, development, as well as renewable integrated uh, energies and life cycle assessments. He um, holds a Master uh, in Science on ca Carbon Capture and Storage from the University of Edinburgh and a Bachelor on Geology from the National University of Ireland. So the floor is yours. Cheers, thank, thank you. you. Uh, hello all, and apologies for the very long bio. I'll shorten it next time. Um, so I don't actually really work with the uh, carbon negative that much. I work with industrial decarbonization and mitigation normally on a day-to-day -day basis, but that's in a way pulled me into carbon negative. Um, my organization in Bologna, it's a Norwegian environmental NGO, but I'm based in Brussels, so I deal with uh, Brussels environmental policy. And carbon negative really jumped onto the scene after AR5 uh, two years ago or so. Um, uh, one thing I want to make clear is that uh, when we talk about carbon negative, we need to talk about all the different forms of carbon negative. So bioenergy CCS is a, is a really important part of the one, and it's the one that the AR5 highlighted. But there's also options like afforestation, uh, soil carbon storage, and people now talk about air capture. 
all of these all have their distinct challenges. Just because we're sitting down here and saying that BioCCS has some issues that mean it's constrained in the future and it can't be our silver bullet, doesn't mean that we jump ship and go straight to saying, well, afforestation is our only solution. The truth is that all carbon negative solutions, when combined, are likely en masse to be relatively limited in comparison to the amount that we would like it to be. Uh, we're not going to be able to say that uh, we have an unlimited ability to suck CO2 out of the atmosphere in, well, in my well, 70s, I guess. Um, <coughs> um, another thing is that, uh, as it was pointed out at the very start of the presentation, is that <coughs> uh, carbon negative is present in all scenarios now. Uh, so CO2 emissions have increased year on year ever since I was born, <coughs> and a long time before that. So the reason why we're all sitting here talking about carbon negative now is that we've failed to do enough about climate change in the past. And my current outlook is that we're still continuing to fail to do enough. Um, the technology that I work primarily with is carbon capture and storage. Uh, it's been shown to work. It's a very obvious and easy way to re reduce CO2 emissions. I'm sure there's a cement plant down the road that would love to have its emissions stopped. But these are things we still haven't deployed. So simple technologies that we could use today to stop CO2 from going into the atmosphere, we're not doing. And yet we're having these conversations about how we will suck CO2 out of the atmosphere in the future. So there is an issue here with a, um, a temporal leaping. Uh, we're almost admitting that we're not going to do enough today, so let's talk about what we could do in the distant future. But that said, we do need carbon negative to work. Uh, carbon negative, when it comes to the Brussels conversation, and when it comes to the European conversation, has been very divisive. Um, when it was first brought up, many people had this idea that it was just a simple way of delaying action today. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with the idea of the moral hazard, that talking, even, even talking about carbon negative, or the potential to do carbon negative, would somehow reduce our ability or give a distraction from reducing emissions today. Uh, the model never says that. The model says that we need to throw everything at the problem that we possibly can to get anywhere close to two degrees or below. But people want to have a, a very linear conversation about what they want to talk about. Um, there's, there's a number of issues emerging with, with, with carbon negative from, from, from that to that point. So you have a, a large group of environmental organizations and NGOs like my own that are very um, skeptical of anything that could be used to delay action into the future. And that's fair. Uh, so we have to keep a focus on mitigation and find carbon negative where we can. Also, you have a large group of industries and emitters who would love to be able to have a, an alternative narrative where they can talk about offsetting and removing CO2 from the, from the atmosphere in the future in a way that insulates them from actions today. So that is also a potential risk. And then you have a whole set of lobby groups and interests that believe that they can relabel what they currently do today as carbon negative. Uh, so, um, uh, anyone here grew up on a farm? No? Well, there's a good chance that you too could be carbon negative in the future, depending how you want to rebrand your soil carbon storage. You have the same thing with the people who produce uh, paper, people who grow forests. These people start showing up to my office, doing the same thing that you do today, but they say, I'm now carbon negative. So, the, the debate is still very, very immature in a sense. We need to start getting to the point where we get good definitions of what carbon negative is and what carbon negative isn't. I'm pretty sure that toilet paper is not carbon negative, but we need to quickly go beyond the point where everyone in that room who talks about carbon negative can understand that. Um, uh, and this is what this paper helps do. It starts showing us that bioCCS by itself can be carbon negative, but under certain conditions. And we need to make sure that if we're going to start subsidizing companies to do things, and if we're going to spend a lot of money, time, and human effort to develop technologies, to develop CO2 to transport and storage, and we're providing something that's carbon negative, and more importantly, we're accounting it in our CO2 global accounting as carbon negative, that it is carbon negative. Uh, I was only told quite recently that there is, still isn't a set definition of what carbon negative is. So don't be surprised that we're only the very start of this journey. Now, I don't want to sound too negative about carbon negative in general. Uh, as I say, I work mostly with mitigation. But carbon negative is actually available to us. We just have to decide how we're going to do it. And we have to, how to say, um, we just need to be sensible about where we start doing it. Uh, it's, it's in, in Sweden, they have a large amount of biomass use that they're using today, it's mostly in the paper industry, but quite a lot in district heating. There's an organization in um, Stockholm that wants to attach uh, CO2 storage to one of their um, district heating. And that means that biomass that they're currently using today, biomass that they will use tomorrow, can be captured. That CO2 can be transported, that CO2 can be stored. And the next time you're on a trip to Stockholm and you have a shower, you're having a carbon negative shower. And that doesn't increase any biomass demand. It's not causing any more deforestation to happen. This is inside the internal system. So we're using the resources we already have to get the maximum carbon benefit we can. And that's how we have to, have to start approaching this problem. Also, just from the point of view of bioenergy CCS, 
bioenergy CCS, from my point of view, is mostly likely going to happen in conjunction with the mitigation. So why do we actually need CCS? It's to reduce CO2 emissions from cement, from steel, and organizations like that. If you have this transport and storage developed, it's around these areas that you can then transfer these from mitigation into carbon negative. You can start putting biomass into these systems. You can start to add biomass combustion in the area where you have transport and storage. So bio CCS in this way is mitigation plus. It'll lead into the things we already have needed to get us someplace close to two degrees. And if we're not willing to stop CO2 emissions coming from a cement factory or a steel factory, then I don't think we should spend too much time talking about doing carbon negative in the future because we need to start to get mitigation going because carbon negative is limited and it won't be able to get us out of jail free. Thank you. Um, thank you, Keith, for clarifying the boundaries of our problem, redefining uh, what we mean by negative uh, emission technologies and reinforcing the need of having carbon capture and storage for the so-called hard to decarbonize sectors, including industry and some subsectors uh, in transport. So last but not the least, I'd like to introduce our last speaker, Joe Oz, who is a principal consultant in e 4 tech company since 2002. And she leads now the, the work on energy innovation and policy. She has a broad knowledge of energy and environment policy and regulatory issues, with particular expertise on biofuels and hydrogen. From 2011 to 2014, she was a strategy advisor of BP Fuels, responsible for managing emerging issues in policy, sustainability and technology. Jo previously worked with the UK Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology, writing their brief note on prospect, uh, prospects of hydrogen economy. And Jo holds a degree in Master's of Science and Meteorology from the University of Cambridge and Environmental Technology here from Imperial College CEP. Thank you very much. <coughs> Excuse me. So I wanted, I mean, this, this paper talks about the reality of BECS, and I wanted to start by just talking about today's reality. As, as other panelists have said, we've got a huge climate challenge. I think we've got a growing acceptance of a need for action, which I think is really positive. But we don't really have very much CCS. We don't really have a scaled biomass industry of anything like the scale that we're talking about needing to meet many of these uh, targets in the future. We have very few perennial energy crops that could be an important part of the, um, of the sustainable supply of bioenergy. And we don't have any policy that drives negative emission technologies or BECs, really. So really today, we're, we're not really anywhere in this technology um, in terms of getting onto those curves of of rollout in the future. Now, that's not to say we're not anywhere with the technology or we're not anywhere with the thinking, but we're, we're definitely nowhere near the beginning of the curve. So the first thing that, that I was interested in in this paper was the models. And so do the models have too much BECs? Do the models not represent BECs very well, not represent negative emission technologies very well? Well, clearly not. They're models. Models generally don't represent much very well, but they represent the future a lot better than not having a model at all. As the paper points out, and the references the paper's based on point out, the models don't include a full range of negative emission technologies. Some of them are very difficult to model. And it's also very difficult for global energy systems models to cope with impacts of many of these technologies, especially when those impacts are variable and when those impacts are local. These are models that have a huge number of parameters to take into account, and whilst they can provide us with a guidance to how different technologies could compete in the future, they can't tell us everything about their impacts or how to mitigate them. <coughs> so some of them probably do overly focus on BECs, especially where they don't actually model any other negative emission technologies. But various review papers have shown that many of the models actually take a, a, a lower level view uh, many 1.5 degree scenarios take a, a lower level view of the amount of bioenergy that might be used um, uh, in, with CCS by 2050 and, and by 2100. So I think whilst the models aren't wonderful and they're, um, they're a useful guide, but there's always room for improvement and there are all, always improvements that can be made 
by linking energy systems models with other impact models so that we can look more at the impact of water stress, so that we can look more at some of the other factors that have been talked about. The second thing I was interested in this paper was the discussion of variability, the variability in the costs and benefits of BECs, and whether that means that you know, we shouldn't be looking at BECs at all. Now, you'll notice that I used the word variability. I didn't use the word uncertainty. And I think this is something you have to be really careful about when looking at bioenergy chains. Some of the graphs that are in, in the report, I think, are about uncertainty, but I think some of them are about variability. The life cycle emissions of bioenergy routes vary hugely. The uncertainty is an entirely different matter. So 10 different ways of producing, um, uh, uh, for example, a biofuel for transport will have very different emissions. They may not be uncertain, they may just be different. They have different crops, different other feedstocks, different transport distances, different conversion processes. There could then be an uncertainty in each of those factors, but the variability and the uncertainty aren't the same thing. So we have to be very careful when showing graphs with a big range and saying, there's a big range, so it's uncertain, so we should be worried, so we shouldn't do anything. Actually, we need to focus on where are those uncertainties, which ones can we reduce, where can we get better knowledge, so that we can ensure that the projects that we focus on first are the ones where we can be sure that there'll be benefits. And that applies to things like the life cycle emissions, to carbon debt, to how much land area you might yield, need, which is a function of yield, um, and to water, which is, is not a very easy thing to give overall numbers about because it's such a location-specific issue. It's always possible to define a terrible supply chain. You know, if you cut down a forest, convert a, 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 a biomass feedstock um, inefficiently, transport it for hundreds of miles and use coal to power that plant, you're going to get a terrible answer. What we need to work out is how you get the good answers. So we need to... to demonstrate those routes so we can focus more on working out what the sustainable potential actually is. So then the last thing I wanted to talk about is the impact of the conclusions that come out of this paper, which you know I, I agree with the other speakers that this raises some very important questions about BECs, but we have to think about the impact of those conclusions on what we do today. There are lots of words in this paper like doubtful, skeptical, controversial, problem, all these kind of things, and some of the policymakers that I've worked with in the past, looking at that, would run a mile and say, we shouldn't do anything at all. This is too worrying an, an area to get into. But you know, if you look at the rest of the negative emission technologies, and actually you look at some other mitigation technologies, there are plenty of problems about all of them. None of them are easy, and none of them are the silver bullet. Um, we, I mean, from a personal point of view, I would like to get on with trying all of them because I'd like to have the option, uh, and I'd like to know really what is going to get us to the, to the levels of greenhouse gas reduction that we need. And some of the words in there, like limited scale, for example, may, to some people might imply a niche, whereas to others it means limited compared with the very big numbers that were in the highest of the, highest of the, of the models. And so we have to be a bit careful about how this is interpreted. Um, you know, to a modeler whose model has gone off and done far too much, this is probably a very valid note of caution. But we have to be careful that to, to others that are thinking about whether they put in place policy that could incentivize the beginnings of a, of a nascent industry, that this doesn't mean, you know, run away. I'm very interested in, in people's different views about, this, about the concept of moral hazard, because, you know, going back to my first point about today's reality, I don't really see much evidence today that the level of VEX in these models is affecting anybody doing anything else. But that's my perspective from, from you know, the people that I talk to. I don't see our failure to do lots of things in mitigation that we have today, to put in place decent building standards, to you know, do all the other things that we need to do, massive deployment of wind and solar that we need you know, starting yesterday, as people said. I don't see that being affected by what a model says about VEX in 2050 or 2100. But it's interesting to see from, from Keith's point of view that actually industries are starting to pick on that as reasons why they shouldn't do anything. And that, and, and that actually struck a chord with me because that's something that I do see. Industries increasingly claiming to be one of these hard to decarbonise sectors that won't be able to do anything or have to buy offsets in the future as opposed to focusing on where they can actually make the big changes that they need to make. So subject to all those caveats, um, 
about how to interpret these things. I think everybody overall has fa fairly good agreement on what we need to do next, you know, in terms of enabling deployment, learning from that, demonstrating savings to work out we, what we can do in a realistic way. But we need to be really careful with the words that we use so that people get the right messages from that. Thanks. a bit behind the schedule. Uh, nonetheless, I would like to kick out the discussion with one or two questions that make me very curious after hearing our panelists' presentations. So for all of you, I'd like to start after hearing you talking about the variable factors that may affect positively or negatively back deployment. Uh, my key question would be, do we really need backs? And if we do, under which conditions? Perhaps I can start from the back with Alex. Um, I don't know if this is on, but yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Uh, well, I think it goes back to what I had said during my brief intervention there. Um, it really is a function of how much we do in the short term. So, and also, how, how many other alternatives become available in the future. Um, there are a number of, of technologies that are starting to come into, um, into trial and pilot projects like direct air capture and things like that. But I think, as, 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 as Joe said, um, we should try all of them. So one of them will eventually become more established for a variety of reasons, criteria that I know I think that will have to be determined by society. But is it really necessary? I mean, given the fact that we are not doing anything, as Keith very well put, um, I think that some kind of removal is going to have to take place if we want to keep it down to 1.5 degrees within any level of certainty. I think that this is the, I think the what I have to say about that. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Mathilde? Sure, I, I can complement Alex's answer. Um, I guess if you if you start from the premise that you need carbon dioxide removal, uh, which which is our premise, then you have to look at the alternative. So maybe I can say a bit, just some few words about what are the other options to do carbon dioxide removal. So you have you can separate carbon dioxide removal into techniques that enhance natural things. So afforestation, for example, the planting more trees, um, biochar or soil carbon sequestration, so putting more carbon or sequestering more carbon into the soil, um, um, enhanced weathering, so putting CO2 into minerals, spreading on the, on the ground, or um, ocean fertilization, so doing more, cap capturing more CO2 in the sea. And, and the problem with natural sink, uh, it is, so they have advantages, that they are cheaper, they are maybe, some of them are maybe also more socially acceptable, such as afforestation. Uh, in terms of ecosystem services that they provide. They also have caveats. Uh, natural sinks means that they're subject to natural disasters. They're subject to more uh, uncertainty in terms of is this CO2 gonna keep, be kept in that sink? Uh, so CO2, perm CO2 storage permanence can be an issue. Uh, they equally need some monitoring. So forest needs to be sustainably managed to make sure that this sink remains intact. Um, and then you have other technologies that require CO2 storage, uh, such as direct air capture, which, is, which, which can be seen as a promising technology. Um, it, is, it has been uh, deployed at, at the pilot scale by, by companies. It is, at the moment, prohibitively uh, expensive. So we are, we are at the thousand a pound per ton of CO2 uh, scale in, at, if we believe the, the physics. Some companies will claim cheaper numbers, but it's just very hard to know at the moment how expensive is, is it going to be? Uh, but I, but I could see the I could see the attraction of, of direct air capture. So I'm not saying it's not going to happen. Uh, I'm just saying that they all have caveats. They all have uncertainty, and and Bex is just as it's just trying to uh, it's just as um, valid as the others to be considered for carbon dioxide removal. Thank you. Well, I would start off by saying that if you can talk about carbon negative at all, then you would have to stop talking about two degrees very quickly. Um, 
uh, on the point that all the carbon negatives are, are limited and have certain issues, that's true. And that tells us that we need to mitigate more. The more actually we do a mitigation, the more secure we'll be because we can't rely on having an unlimited amount of carbon negative. But on the other options for carbon negative, so I know a lot of people say, oh, BEX is difficult, so therefore should we do direct air capture? But when I talk to politicians and I talk to industry about direct air capture, it's really hard to how do you see that fly, even if it was cheap because you have an issue where it doesn't provide any service apart from just removing CO2 from the atmosphere. It's very hard to organize a system where that would actually be selected and where human civilization would put a lot of resources into solely just removing CO2 from the atmosphere. If you plant a forest, you get huge biosystem services from it. If you have bioenergy CCS, you can heat your shower and go carbon negative simultaneously, but air capture won't do that. So we need to make sure that what we do is also providing the inputs that our society requires in a carbon negative way. Otherwise, it's very hard to make these things fly. Well, the issue is coming lots of things you thought you were going to say have been said. So, yeah, I think it's very unlikely we are, we are going to meet that IPCC pathway, um, which didn't rely on any negative emissions at all, unfortunately. So I think as a planet, we do need them. And I think, of course, we're going to need a whole variety of different types. So um, I do think that every technology you look at, as you have said, has its strengths and weaknesses. Um, that shouldn't stop us trying to have a go and learn by doing because we urgently need to do that so I think we need to get on and start um, I also I see these large scale that you talk about in this paper, we're so far away from that that I don't think we should be scared about having a go and I think it's by having a go that we'll realise where the issues are with all of these. Talking about that specifically, um, I do believe the world needs some bioenergy, if you're going to do bioenergy then you really have to do it with BEX now. I think that's where we've come to that conclusion is it's absolutely the best use of bioenergy is in conjunction with CCS, and I think that's the way we should be going. Why I believe the world needs some bioenergy is um, based on various different analyses that say solar and wind are absolutely fantastic, but there will be times when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine, and some grids in the world cannot cope with that and will need some thermal generation, which is easily dispatchable, and their bio has a role. And if you're doing that, then I think you just have to capture that carbon from it and get that double benefit. Thank you. Uh, sure. uh, yeah, I, I would agree with pretty much everything everybody else said. I think the only thing to add is, well, you can flip the question around and say, what would happen if we found that we didn't need BEX? You know, if we ha did have a breakthrough in direct air capture because um, we found a much, much cheaper way of making renewable electricity which is what the direct, direct air capture needs and a much more efficient way to do it. And we found that, you know, the, the BEX plants we started to build that we didn't, you know, we didn't need um, for the purposes of being carbon negative, you know, would there be, you know, what, what would the risk be of that? And I think that provided that you have some bioenergy in a system, then everything that you do now helps with that. So if you think you're going to need any bioenergy in the system at all, either for grid services like you're talking about, or production of chemicals, production of you know all kinds of other things, that developing high-yielding perennial energy crops, working out how to grow them sustainably, building up supply chains to get them to a plant where they're processed, say gasified, you can then do a huge number of things with that. If you don't start doing that now, you don't get to the to the um, to the scales that we see in the future. Every time we've done any models of scaling up of any bioenergy technologies, the thing we always come down to is the build rate and how fast you can start doing it and how you make the investment condition for that to happen. Um, that always, in our models, limits where you get to um, in, 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 in the 2050 time frame. Thank you very much. Um, I have another question to the panel and then I'd like to open the floor to further questions from you. Um, talking about limits, we've seen before, and our panelists clearly showed how models tend to be technocentric. Most of them show perfect foresight optimization solutions, but we do know our reality is different. We face other limitations rather than energy efficiency and costs. So in, in your views, and assuming that we can't afford to live without carbon capture and storage if we take serious the IPCC reports and the pathways to reach 1.5, what, what is missing? What, what is missing to have a go, as Rebecca mentioned? And this time I start from my left side, so you have more room for your views. Thank you. Um, I'd say apart from the technology, the thing that's missing is, is the policy to create the market framework for these technologies to be deployed. Um, 
and you know for the for the first for the first projects it's very difficult to deal with technology risk um, uh, even if you do have that framework set up so um, I mean we've been doing some work recently on how you might establish a, a, a market framework that could support all negative emission technologies and, and the answer is not straightforward because um, as the other panelists have discussed some of them you know make energy products some of them don't they're at very different scales they have very different geographical reach so it's it's quite hard to define a policy that would do that and then um, you know governments need to work out how how they would like that to be paid for I say very carefully in the passive as opposed to suggesting who might do it thank you Rebecca. so you need to have a strong policy framework you know we've seen what happens when governments do 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 something with a strong policy framework. That's why Drax isn't burning coal anymore. So that's really worked. Um, so I think we need to have a bold government to go and um, set that framework up um, and to provide those market mechanisms. So I think something like long-term contracts that always gives investors a lot more confidence in this and also support, obviously, for, for innovation. Um, and some way of... of particularly with the carbon storage, how do we understand the liability of that? Who's going to take the liability for the storage? So these are all things that, that are needed. We have had positive movement from the government. They've set out this this plan in roadmap. We have to hope that they um, they do deliver on it. So. Uh, well, I guess the, the overarching one is always uh, certainty. Certainty that our economies are decarbonizing and certainty that we are intentionally going towards two degrees because that solves a lot of the issues. Because if we're actually going to do that, then a lot of these technologies will appear and a lot of these policies can be put into place. But at the moment, we seem to be still touching around the problem. We haven't really grabbed it so far. Uh, I would say for a no regrets option uh, with uh, BioCCS or without BioCCS, developing CO2 transport and storage ne networks would be very useful because they can help decarbonize industry power and provide carbon negative in the future. So we don't have to decide exactly where we land in 2050, but we know the parts of the system that we will need in 2050. So I would say prioritizing the nuts and bolts for the decarbonization, the, the tools that we can use. Um, I would add on the, on the policy side in the way that we uh, well, the sustainable deployment of BEX will rely on the clear certification framework of the, of the BEX value chain. So I agree with, with Joe that the, it's not really much a problem of uncertainty, but variability of performance. And so we need a clear carbon accounting framework and certification, uh, which is also cross borders because of biomass imports and exports. Uh, and, and that's really required to, um, to make sure it's sustainable. And, and the problem at the moment is that we mainly focus on CO2 emissions, which is still very important. Specs it wants to be carbon negative, but there's also other factors such as water use, land use change that, that really need to be accounted for in those sustainability criteria to make sure that we don't have unintended consequences of OPEX deployment. Yeah, I don't have too much to add. I think the only thing that I'd say is like pick up on you, you mentioned the limits to BEX, and a lot of uh, people push back on 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 on. Backs because they think there's too much of it in these projections, in these scenarios. And, th and then my question is, okay, if not that much, then how much? Should it be zero? Well, if it is zero, then what are th the other actions that you would support in order to get us to the, to the targets that we have set ourselves as a, as a global society? So it's somewhere in, in between zero and a very large amount. But this somewhere in between is still very far away from where we are today. So th there is room to move towards, uh, towards the development of this, of this market. And, and I think that CO2 pipelines become important, certification standards become important, policy framework to support all of these things in a systemic way is probably uh, a way to, to think about where we want to get and how to get there. Thank you, Alex and all. I would just like to add one aspect that hasn't been touched upon. So uh, in IPCC special report on 1.5, scientists define six criteria of, uh, to make a technology or a response being feasible. And one of them that seems to be overlooked nowadays is social acceptability. Mm -hmm. And from BACs, we can actually learn from nuclear waste experience and how we can actually interfere or delay deployment of a certain technology. But with no further delay, I would like to open the floor to questions. Um, I'm f I would tend to, to 
together two or three questions in one go and then uh, ask you to introduce yourself and who the question should go to. So I saw this one hand first here. Yeah, um, it's really a, a question. I'm oh, sorry, my name is Nick James. This is a question for the whole panel. Is, in terms of cutting down CO2 emissions, as far as I'm concerned, it should be zero mm. for a temperature rise, not 1.5. That's just agreeing to raising temperatures, which we should be going mm. for. But surely the cheapest way, you have to work out because money comes in as well, is it cheaper to simply dump fossil fuels, use nuclear hydro and renewable, generate electricity and run electric vehicles, or going for bags, you know, carrying on using fossil fuels and removing all the fossil fuel emissions using bags, which is the cheaper and surely the most cost effective way to work forward. Because people won't take up the technology Yeah, thank you. Um, I don't know. So I don't I think um, we will need to fully decarbonize electricity and I could see us using the bags for other sectors, such as aviation, such as agriculture, where we really don't think we have a lot of other options at the moment. So I don't think it's either that or BECS. I think I don't think the BECS is linked to the decarbonisation of the electricity system. Uh, just a, a role of BECS as well as to, in a way, undo the sins of the past. The fact that you emitted CO2 emissions yesterday, the day before that, is the reason why we need BECS in 2050. And the fact that this curve that we need to bring down is crazily steep, you know, we really have to start reducing CO2 emissions in the tens of percents year on year, is very, very difficult to do. <laughs> and this is why BEX comes into it, because the feasibility of halving our CO2 emissions in 10 years seems unfeasible. Thank you. Um, so, Dave, please. Uh, please introduce yourself. Uh, Dave Bell, uh, postdoc at Imperial, also looking at BEX. Um, I've worked with a couple of people here as well, so um, I guess I've, I've been framing BEX within a wider framework that's looking at um, focusing on land use change, but also looking at impacts to people, um, to, to equity, to sustainable development in its broadest sense. Um, and if we're looking at the big picture of transformational societal change in order to meet not only the Paris Agreement but the sustainable development goals, um, there's, there's a lot more to think about than what we've talked about tonight. Um, but one thing that we've kind of concluded through my short bit of work is that we really need to just get on and do it and maximize our learning about how to do BEX well. Um, not just do it most efficiently or most um, the, the least cost method, um, but defining well will depend on the context, it will depend on the people who are being impacted who have to contribute to it. Um, so I guess my question is for anyone who would like to pick it up, um, is where what are the opportunities for having rapid um, or as quick as possible deployment where we can start learning about some of the really key uncertainties around banks. So how do we, how would we practically start to learn about it in a way that we can see what is feasible in terms of scaling up? Do you want to take what? more questions or should we? Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, the, <laughs> I think it goes back to what, what Rebecca said. I think we just need to get on and start doing and learn by doing. I think that that is um, something that is really there's a lot. There's a lot to be learned from just going ahead and doing something rather than talking about it, thinking about it, putting writing papers about it, and things like that. I think th that you you come across problems once you actually build the thing that you that are not foreseen. Um, I think in terms of alternatives, it de it, it really depends on geography. Um, it depends on assumptions. Um, if you're looking at Bex in the UK, it's going to be a very different reality than if you're looking at Bex in South America. Um, I think governance, the strength of institutions, plays a really big role on how sustainable you can get with anything. With building a road can be a, a real major problem. Building a subway line, it can just take people and you know take them away from where they live and just build something where there used to be houses. And if there's very weak governance, very weak um, institutions. So I think that that needs to be considered, but then there's also the question of potential and cost. Um, in, I think, I mean, my, my research is taking me in the direction that I think what we really, that I, I, I put, tend to put more value into, into bioliquids than bioelectricity because electricity has different options. You can do wind, solar, if there's lots of other alternatives, hydropower even. Um, but with particularly with diesel and 
jet fuel. There are very few alternatives. I mean, people talk about hydrogen airplanes, but that is like 50 years in the future, if we ever get there. Um, so, and I don't really think that demand for um, plane kilometers are going to go down anytime in the near future, no matter what you say about behavior change. I think it's only going to go up, and trade brings um, demand for transportation by trucks. So I think that that is a place that we can go to. And making biodiesel, not from soy, but from lignocellulosic material via fisher trope routes. They have been used in the past by two not very um, flavorable uh, governments, but it has been at, <laughs> at scale and successfully. So if they've done it from coal and coal to liquids, you can do biomass to liquids very easily as well. We know that technology. So maybe that's a place to start doing it. Mm -hmm. And the thing that's interesting about those, particularly both ethanol and diesel, is that there you need to, for diesel, you need to control the level of CO2 that's in your gas mixture anyway. So removing that CO2 is easy. You just then compress it. So it's very cheap to actually do the capture part. So I think that that is an opportunity um, that should be uh, examined a little more carefully as well. Thank you. So, yeah, I think. My name is Arnold. Uh, I'm a master's student in climate change at UCL. Uh, my question was a bit similar. So the, the, the panel and, and the paper things, by the way, um, they're very technical. Um, but there are huge social implications for why deployment as well. So maybe um, you could touch up upon some of the international developmental issues that you, that you see, or maybe Thank you. Uh, I guess the, the only point I would make first, and I'm not the expert in this, but my uh, my knowledge of this is that the inclusion of CCS on bio or not isn't the key driver of biomass use in the models. So if CCS isn't present in the models and you don't use biomass with CCS, you're still using biomass in the models to a greater or lesser extent. So CCS, bio-CCS in the hunt for negative emissions isn't, isn't what driving uh, biomass use. Biomass is hugely useful. It's almost like the, the finger in the dike because it can decarbonize so many different parts of society. So combining biomass with CCS is a way of giving you a better climate benefit for that biomass that was likely going to be allocated to the model either way. I'm happy to talk about some of our supply chains. So we, as I said, we burn 7.5 million tons of wood at the moment, um, mainly from Canada, from the southern states of the US, the Baltics, um, Portugal, and a little bit from Brazil. And so the social impacts are, are very local. A lot of these and biodiversity impacts are very local and it's really important to get out on the ground and understand the impacts in communities and to do really good stakeholder engagement before you source from an area. And that's that's what we do. And in some areas, particularly in the southern states of the US, you know, I'll tell you the good stories. You know, we we've been welcomed with open arms because we're taking wood that went to a paper mill that's closed down. And so these areas are really, really depressed because all of that employment's gone. And we've come in and are offering a market for that very small scale sort of thinning so that, that there is no other market for. So there can be some really good stories here. Um, I think you have to look at it at a local level and you have to have strong governance. So we have to report very clearly to the UK government on all of this and on all of these impacts. And we're also working with NGOs on the ground in each, in each of our supply regions as well. So it's not easy to get it right, <laughs> but it can be done. And, and I think actually trying doing it brings up those issues and, and makes us learn more about it. So, for example, um, uh, sugarcane ethanol production in Brazil. Um, there are lots of papers have been written about this, uh, lots of discussion about different impacts, um, but when, when I was working in that area, one of the big local concerns was about dust, which came from the trucks that were, were, were transporting the, the feedstock or the, or the finished material about. Now, that's not something that many people would have thought of as the thing that would be the main concern to the local community at the time. So I think it's about um, trying projects in different places, um, trying to set them up in a, in a socially as well as an environmentally sustainable way, but then making sure that there's a, a degree of transparent documentation of the issues that are raised so that projects in the future can learn from that and decide whether they can be, c c can be replicated in, in a sustainable way. Thank you. I, I would also add, um, from, the, from the stakeholder engagement perspective, uh, I mean, we're talking about international development, but even from the UK perspective, um, it's uh, not easy to get farmers to to uh, provide bioenergy, for example, uh, 
just the crop residues or growing perennial grasses on, on set-aside land that might be available in the farm. These are, to look back with your question, Dave, these are all opportunities as well of bioenergy supply that could be exploited, but it, it's not easy to engage farmers to, to make that bioenergy supply available. Uh, and so, for example, that there was this uh, separate scheme in the UK, it's an energy crop scheme that wanted to incentivize farmers to grow perennial grasses on marginal land, uh, but because of uncertainty around uh, policy or, or uh, market contract price of, of, these, of these perennial grasses, uh, this, uh, this scheme was discontinued because of lack of applicants. So it, it is really important to, to put it in place those scheme and to make sure that uh, farmers are actually engaged or feel engaged to, to provide bioenergy um, for, for negative emissions or for other uses. Uh, thank you. And I, I see a couple of hands on top. I'll go for you very, very quickly on the moral aspects. Not really sure if you were mentioned specifically the need for adaptation in most vulnerable communities because w with bugs and overshooting scenarios, we will have uh, expenses and climate impacts in the short term until we stabilize temperature to 1.5. So in my views, uh, BACS and, and CCS does not necessarily address that moral and the costs for adaptation in most vulnerable areas. So I leave the floor open again. Uh, given the time, I'll probably take three questions at once, if that's okay. So one, please introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, one more. Uh, at the back. Sorry, said first. Hi, uh, Richard King, Chatham House. It's another geographical question. Um, in terms of the sustainable limit, you've got the paper. I don't know if there are any geographical assumptions behind that, but I'm just wondering where you see feedstocks coming from, I guess, particularly energy um, um, drops as opposed to residues. Um, both at the, at the sustainable level you have in the model, but also in terms of some of the IA. Yeah, thank you. So we have first for Rebecca two questions, one on the net targets and the second one on opportunities for domestic uh, bioenergy development here in the UK. And the third and fourth question, I would leave it to Alex and Mathilde on the scale of bags required and um, the feedstocks considered. So um, I, I'm 
can't really talk about what the CCC are doing. I'll have to wait till May the second. Um, what about how do you do it in the UK? So, um, drugs don't source from the UK. We we source 100% from imports. We have taken some UK crop residues. We wouldn't rule that out in the future. There are real cost implications, though. So why we source from predominantly, say, the southern states of the US, is because the trees there grow really fast. They're massive, massive areas of forest. The wood baskets are immense, and it's a very mature forest industry. So we don't we don't really have that in the UK. But um, I should probably sort of come clean about me as an individual. So I'm a forester, so obviously I like, I like my trees. I did a PhD on willow in the early 90s, and then I spent the rest of probably that decade growing miscanthus on farms and trying to persuade farmers to grow it under the energy crop scheme. So I've kind of dabbled in all of these different feedstocks. Um, I, I think it's all about how you incentivize a farmer to do it, so there has to be some, some money for him to want to do that. I do see a role for forestry, though, particularly... Um, if you look at the uplands of, of Britain, what are we going to do with the uplands when we come out of Europe? Are we going to have sheep? Are we going to have trees? There's certainly scope for more afforestation. The thing about growing trees is that you have your options open as a landowner. You can go in and you can plant, say, a plantation, and we, we should be growing our plantations much better than we are. We're absolutely shocking. We've got the worst plantations in the world for biodiversity. We can be growing them in a much better way. But you could grow some plantations. You could even link some rewilding areas with these forests. And you could go and take your thinnings out, age 18, and you could use those small trees for bioenergy. And then you could take out your larger trees when they're saw logs and use those as long-term carbon sequestration in buildings. 50% of a saw log is also sawdust, by the way, that's ideal for bioenergy. So I don't see it as being trees or bioenergy particularly. I think there's a way, there's an integrated system that we could be doing. On other land, could you have energy crops that grow faster than trees and they give you something sooner? Yes, quite possibly, but I think we need crops which are easy to harvest and fit into a normal sort of farming landscape. So, for instance, Miss Canthus, a farmer can harvest that using his own equipment that's already out there. You don't need anything specialist, so that's more of a reason to do it. The problem is often the farmer will give you the worst field, so you get on this farm, he doesn't want to give you the best one, and then you get really low yields. So, having said that, there's a lot of work going on on breeding, so I think we're going to need a mosaic, we're going to need it all. Um, I do think there's definitely a role for more afforestation in the UK, but we have to do it in the right way. Yeah, thank you. So uh, now the question on uh, the, the feedstocks use and the scale of packs. Um, I'll just um, compliment on the answer for the UK bioenergy potential for, for Richard, that asked of PEX uh, potential in the UK. So the, the CCC has, has published very useful numbers in terms of how, how much bioenergy can be available in the UK and how much bioenergy can be available as imports to the UK. Um, and so the scale of, of PEX potential in the UK has been, uh, is mainly, well, it depends on how we convert that bioenergy to negative emissions. Are we using PEX via power, are we using PEX via biofuel or bio, biohydrogen? But overall, the range of potential is around the uh, 30 to 60 megatons of CO2 per year of what could be done with indigenous biomass supply and can go up to, I think I wrote it down here, uh, maybe 150 megatons of CO2 per year if we started to import biomass. And then the bottleneck would be um, technology ramp up. So that, that's kind of the, the picture of the, of the UK for BEX potential. Um, do you want to speak about feedstock? Yeah, I think, so I guess look if you're talking about these scenarios then we're talking about what these integrated assessment models are, are, are using as input assumptions and the range of feedstocks is limited um, there is a lot of miscanthus there is a lot of pine a lot of eucalyptus for the woody species uh, usually they're calibrated to miscanthus um, to the assumptions that they, they put in um, there's some coppice that goes in there. But the regions, um, just so going to your question, so the regional sourcing of this, usually it's South America, Southeastern US, Canada, Ukraine even pops up as, as, as a source of, of feedstock in some models. Um, Africa is a big uncertainty. And although there is high growth potential there, um, I think the infrastructure adds as a acts as a limiting uh, condition on that. Um, so 
it really, I think, and I think also the assumptions vary a lot in terms of cost per unit of delivered energy that um, that comes out of them. How they evolve? Do they do they increase? Do they decrease? And there's a lot of uncertainty in that as well. Um, you can do an exogenous projection of what, how much you think that your technology learning by doing is going to bring your cost projection down in terms of cost of dollars per gigajoule, but what that, what happens in in the land use side is that once you start increasing the profitability of the land, then the price of the land goes up. Once the price of the land goes up, you usually have more pressure for expansion, and then there's pressure for deforestation. And this is the kind of thing we see a lot in South America. Work a lot in South America, and this is the dynamic there. So you bring brings up land tenure issues. It brings up just land speculation or expansion of, of just agricultural production, livestock issues, diet change will, f will come into this as well, whether we continue, uh, you know, if people are going to eat like Europeans, we're going to have a problem. Um, so we've already fished the oceans, you know, out of fish. So there's a lot of assumptions in there and how, how you control these things. So it, it's, um, it's, it's, very, it's very uncertain, but I think that the developing regions are the ones that are <coughs> supplying a lot of these scenarios. Thank you, Alex. Uh, I'd like to go for a last round of questions, and I have one here, one there. Uh, yes? Yeah. Um, so, uh, sorry, Jim McCleary, um, Tyndall Center. So we've defined this as like a global problem, um, and we've said that we need to get on with it. So I'm interested in kind of like how we decide who needs to go first. Is it, is it the UK that should go first and like learn all these lessons, or should someone else go first and then we learn all their, their, their lessons and yep. go second? Thank you. And one here? Thank you. So uh, the first on the global problem and who goes first, uh, perhaps Joe, do you want to have a go? I heard an interesting comment at a talk the other day where somebody said uh, that if a technology has been de demonstrated outside the UK, then some within the UK think that we've missed a boat <laughs> and shouldn't get involved. And if a technology hasn't been demonstrated outside the UK, then it's far too risky and we definitely shouldn't do it. <laughs> and I have seen some of that. Um, from when when kind of presenting recommendations from, from things that we've done in the past. I mean, my personal view is I think that this is something that the UK is very well placed to, um, to, to have a go at um, because we have uh, a lot of interest in CCS, in not just in VEX, but for decarbonising industry and for hydrogen production um, with the projects that are going on in various places about creating hydrogen grids and things like that. So I think we've got a lot of synergies between different potential CCS users as well as current experience with large scale use of biomass. Mm -hmm. So I think putting those things together, um, I think the, the, the UK is, is a good place to do a project. That doesn't mean that I don't think that other countries shouldn't be looking at the same thing at the same time because there are other ways that BECs can be done um, which are different and we could learn from all of them. One example of kind of almost a surprise, uh, <coughs> I had a meeting with a, um, a waste incinerator in the Netherlands who have built about a 100,000 ton CO2 capture unit. And it was a very big surprise to them that they found that if they store that CO2, they would likely be just about carbon negative. So these things can happen almost kind of by accident in a sense. And this is because the waste incinerator has a biogenic fraction going into the waste. Mm -hmm. So sometimes if we look out, we can find carbon negative in unusual places <coughs> while we're looking for mitigation simultaneously. And, and I will just add on the, on the who should go first. I mean, from a very theoretical, optimal kind of way, from a cost perspective or resource per perspective, really the, the best case would be that the regions where it's very sustainable to grow biomass because of high yield and because of good practices. Uh, so those regions would provide the biomass. The regions that has good storage would provide the CO2 storage. And then the regions that have none of it would pay other regions to do capitalizing removal for them. 
but that really relies on the international cooperation of region. Um, and so again, we need cross-border certification, but also a market that could allow credit trading and, and all of this. And so, yes, a region should go first and show the example, but ultimately we would need a cooperation of regions to make that roll out in an optimal way. <coughs> Keep an eye on Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think Sweden is a good case in point because it has an active forestry industry, it has good governance. So and storage being developed in Norway. Storage being developed yeah. in Norway, exactly, with uh, depleted oil um, wells. One thing, uh, in, again, going back to, to, to the scenarios in the IPCC, if you plot regions, the year at which regions attain that zero, no matter how, like, I wouldn't say no matter how, but um, I've tried a few different configurations of scenarios, just did the whole database, selected a few <coughs> scenarios. Almost invariably, Latin America goes first. So Latin America gets to net zero around 2040, the median, big range of uncertainty, uh, of a spread, it's not really uncertainty, I think it's more of a model spread. Um, and um, the rest of the world goes more towards 2050, OECD goes 2050, 2060. <coughs> I'm actually working with a group of Latin American uh, academics who we have a paper under review, um, taking that as a premise and then going out and looking at, okay, how feasible is that from the bottom up? if you look at what the countries are doing. And if you look at Latin America, uh, there's a lot of investment in, and, in, and vested interests and incumbents in fossil fuel industries. You have um, a lot of petroleum and coal in Colombia, natural gas in Argentina, Brazil is set to become a major oil exporter. These governments may be talking and having NDCs and whatnot, but they're making ma massive investments into fossil fuel <laughs> development. With the governance problem, I think that that means that Latin America would probably not get to net zero first. There's infrastructure issues, there's a bunch of things. So that means that OECD or the rest of the world will have to do more if we are going to get to where we want, obviously the big if. So I think that I'll, I'll, I'll echo, echo what is being said here, that I think that the UK is a place that has a, a lot of reasons to to actually have higher ambition. Um, it has a good industry, history of innovation, it's a good industrial park, there's lots of CCS capability. So um, I think that, that kind of answers. Yeah, thank you. I would also like to reinforce the opportunities in terms of economics and a very exactly. debatable uh, argument as well, which I don't want to open at the moment in three minutes left, so we end. Uh, the historical emissions and the moral for OECD versus no OECD. So the last question before I draw it to an end uh, goes to sustainable standards for bioenergy. Who was it for? Uh, to, yeah. So, um, yeah, you, I, I do believe you can buy sustainable biomass from unregulated countries. You have to do a lot more work to be confident. So, um, for Drax, we're pretty much contracted out to 2027, so I know my supply regions and I know my suppliers very well. So I'm probably not looking to expand massively on that. And just to show you, we actually only take from about 50 pellet mills around the world. So our, our source of our sort of unit when we're assessing sustainability is an individual pellet mill. There aren't that many of these. This isn't like Unilever or M&S. We're taking hundreds of different supply chains all around the world. So it's actually quite straightforward to get real granularity that that individual pellet mill will sit in an area. So we have quite strong standards in the UK at the moment. As a company, we're always looking at what we can do beyond compliance as well, and we're looking a lot at new science and what we can do beyond that. In terms of the standards which are in place, um, to talk a little bit about historically what, what, what Drax have done. So we were sending in our auditors, so we always audit, we ask them loads of questions before we source them anywhere, and those, the answers to those questions fall apart of the contract with the supplier. Um, before we source them anywhere, we also do a country risk assessment to understand the laws in each area and what sort of regulations are in place. So, for example, child labour, probably not an issue in the UK, might be if we ever took from Indonesia. We don't take from Indonesia, by the way. But, you know, that, that sort of thing. When there's good rules and regulations, then we know we need to do less checks on some of those issues. We just need to make sure those are reinforced. 
But what was happening was we were sending in our auditors and then we realised that some of the other European generators were also sending in their auditors and these poor pellet mills were just being audited non-stop. So we got together and we said, why don't we write one standard and, um, and then actually get independent auditors to audit against that and issue certificates saying whether or not that company's met that. And that is <coughs> its arm's length. So we've set that up. It's called the Sustainable Biomass Programme. And so we wrote a standard as an industry and said, this meets the regulation. Um, and there's something called Accreditation Services International, which manage lots of environmental schemes. They accredit different bodies called certifying bodies. Those people go out audit the meal and say whether it is or not sustainable and whether it meets it and all those documents are on a website so it also helps transparency and you also have to do a lot of stakeholder engagement so we feel that's working and an issue with that was obviously the industry set it up so we've had a big governance transformation going on where we're trying to get NGOs to sit on the board as well and we have now got academics and civil society sitting on the board so that's an example of a standard which meets <coughs> minimum regulation um, it's much better for me um, if the world is regulated because it means that all my competitors are also keeping to the same standards as we are. It's also much easier for trade. So I am a fan of, of certification and having these independent certificates. Um, and certainly there's areas that, that we are not looking to go into but I am aware the Sustainable Biomass Programme is talking to like Japan and, and <coughs> Southeast Asia are saying we've got the standard here. This, this has been to some extent accepted by civil society. Um, I would also say sustainability is about more than a certificate though, it's about knowing your suppliers. So there's always a balance between how much a certificate gives you and how much you have to do yourself on the ground, just getting to know your suppliers, knowing who you're working with, talking to various stakeholders in each region as well. And SPP does that, but as a responsible sustainability manager, I like to also make sure I've done some of that too. So that's where I, where I sort of see it going. I don't know if that answers what you were, you were saying. Okay, so given time constraints, we already reached the red line of 7.30. Uh, I'd like you to help me uh, congratulating our big applause of our panelists. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming here today. And I'd like to invite you to follow up discussions informally outside by the reception. So once again, thank you. Mm -hmm.